Okay, ready. Oh, yeah, yeah. Tell, tell me what it's like uh, working with Jack Palance in your experience. Well, uh, as you say, I worked with him on two films. I first worked with him in 1978 on a picture called Angel's Brigade, and then the following year, 1979, on Without Warning. Um, Jack was a very uh, interesting fellow. You know, he had a reputation of being kind of a difficult guy, had a little bit of a temper and so forth. But uh, my working with him was uh, wonderful. He was very, very patient, and he was good with the inexperienced actors, the young people that I had working with him. And uh, he, he showed up on time. He knew his lines. He, he was very inventive. In fact, on Without Warning... Uh, I remember one time uh, I was in his trailer and we were talking about the next scene we were going to do, and I happened to look at his script, and he had handwritten little notes throughout his script on what his character was thinking and what the character would be doing and how he wanted to do this or do that. So even though it was a real low-budget movie, we shot the whole picture in three weeks, and Jack only worked a week on the picture. Uh, he didn't shine it off or, or, or blow it off or anything of that nature. He uh, was very serious about his work, very professional, and a very, very good guy. I have nothing but praise for Jack Palance. All right. And um, what one very fascinating thing I noticed about your Without Warning movie is that it's, it's one of the few monster movies to actually go di directly for like an alien that looks like an alien. You actually have an alien in there that looks a lot like, you know, from the little abduction accounts and stuff. And I've seen that done in like movies that are directly affiliated with that subject like uh, Roswell and A Fire in the Sky. But uh, your, yours is the only, is like one of the only like monster films to have like a, one of those bulbous headed ones. Anyway, uh, what motivated the, the look of, of, of the creature, and uh, how, how did you uh, come up with uh, uh, the, the, the idea behind uh, what, what he does and uh, what his motivations are? And, uh, yeah, just tell me a little bit about the creature in your little film. Yeah. Uh, uh, basically what happened is a friend of mine was developing a script about an alien that comes to Earth to hunt people, which eventually became without warning. And he, he was developing the script, and then for whatever reason, he decided not to move forward with it. And he said to me, uh, he suggested that I take a look at the script. And uh, the script was about an alien hunter who came to Earth to, to hunt people as his prey. And the alien hunter used a bow and arrow. Um, and I read the script, and there was a lot in it that I liked a lot, but there was also quite a bit in it that I didn't think uh, was uh, was going to work. So when my friend uh, said, look, that he just uh, wasn't going to be able to do the movie, he was going on and do something else, um, uh, I took the project over and did an extensive rewrite on it, and uh, I described the alien to uh, uh, as, as the guy with the big head, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, because from the television that, that was being played at that time uh, and, and back a few years, you know, that's the way they, uh, that, that, that's the way that uh, uh, they kind of looked and and I thought that, that that could be really interesting. And Greg Canham was the makeup artist who created that uh, big-headed uh, monster. Uh, Greg went on to have a terrific career. This was very early in his career. He won a couple of Academy Awards. I know he won, won one for Mrs. Doubtfire. Uh -huh. And uh, he, he was a, a brilliant guy. So, so we started doing sketches. I said, we, he started doing sketches. I couldn't sketch a, a, a stick figure. But uh, he started doing sketches on what it might look like, and we worked on it and worked on it. And then uh, once we had the alien pretty well uh, set, 
And then I thought, well, how do we dress him? What does he look like? Well, he's a hunter, so I put him in kind of a, a costume that could be a hunter. But I did not like the idea of, of the alien using a bow and arrow. It seemed, I don't know, too much of this world to me. So I thought, what if he has some unique thing that he hunts with? And I came up with the idea of these little flying frisbees, you know, with the little teeth and the, and the tentacles that come out and dig into people. And he flips them like a frisbee. Um, and and I came up with that. Uh, I remember my first thinking was, well, I'm not a hunter, although I'm from the Midwest, so I certainly know hunters. Uh, I, I, I thought, you know, hunters use dogs, don't they, to go out and once they shoot down their prey, the dog will fetch it and bring it back and what have you. And I thought, what if this alien had a little live creature that he could fling at his prey and that that became a unique signature of the movie. Hey, so Kathy. we we again, Greg Canham developed that with me, and he did a terrific, terrific job on it. And this was long before digital effects. So all of those flying creatures in the picture, they're on a little tiny invisible wire that we would slide them down, and and I put the edge of them, I put a glowing effect to them. So uh, we had to physically create those things where today you could sit at a computer and, and do them quite easily. I, 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 was curi I was curious about how exactly he uses them. So does the alien always have to throw them, or can he even, like, send them out and have them, like, flying on their own, you think? No, the way, the way I conceived it is he would have to fling them. He would have to throw them, again, like a Frisbee, kind of a cross throw. Uh, uh, and then once they hit, and if they missed a target, like in some cases they miss the human that they're being thrown at and they hit a, uh, well, one of them hits a post outside of the bar that the guys are in, and then they'll stick onto that. And then I had Jack Palance come out uh, in one scene, take his knife and peel them off. And, and uh, so I had an interaction of these live things, but uh, they did not have, uh, in my mind, a mind of their own. They were just a living organism that the creature would throw at his prey. Um, one of the most interesting characters you have in that film is, of course, uh, Landau. Landau and Palance are like, Landau, Palance, and the alien basically carry the film really, really well between the three of them. Of course, you have the teenage characters. But um, Landau, Landau's character is Sarge. He, he, um, he makes a claim that he's being controlled somehow, and uh, you kind of wonder, is he just crazy or is it or in some ways true? When the alien throws things at people, um, Palance is the only one that can get them off of him. Is, is, is there any, is, is, is Sarge in any way correct about the hypnosis, or is he just completely crazy, or, and are, are any of the victims under any kind of, uh, under any kind of particular uh, shock or, or of, the, of the alien when they when they get those things in them. Uh, no, I, I always felt that uh, uh, Marty's uh, Martin Landau's character was crazy from the war. Uh, uh, there's 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 some lines in there when he starts really going flipping out toward the end of the picture, and Jack, Jack Palance says to him, or excuse me, Landau says something about being in a jungle. And Palance says, this, this is no jungle. You're back home. You're back home, Sarge. So, so I thought he was suffering from some sort of uh, uh, battle fatigue, some sort of stress uh, dictated by his uh, uh, being in Vietnam. So I don't think that there was any mind control that the alien had. Sarge says to the two young kids, he thinks the alien has, is controlling their mind in some way. So, so uh, uh, I never felt that our alien creature had any uh, hypnotic or mental powers that would uh, allow him to do anything like that. I, I, and Marty Landau, uh, this was, as I said, the second picture I worked with Jack Palance. Uh, this was my first one with Marty Landau. The next picture I did, I used Marty in. Right. And again, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but Marty was wonderful to work with. I mean, he was very professional. He he worked with the young actors, and 
and very uh, inventive and full of ideas for me and uh, really just a wonderful, wonderful guy. Uh, and, of course, both Palance and Landau went on to win Academy Awards. So I used to say uh, maybe, maybe they had gotten lucky working with me. But believe me, I had nothing to do with their success. Well, w weren't, they, weren't they pretty big actors even at the time you were working with them? Oh, very much so, sure. I mean, both of them had had long, long storied careers. I mean, I mean, Palance had been already nominated for an Academy Award in Shane, and uh, Landau had won Emmys and been on Broadway, and Palance was on Broadway when uh, Marlon Brando uh, had his great success of Streetcar Named Desire. Jack Palance did the role in the touring company. So they had had long, long, uh, storied careers as a very professional, well-known actors. What, what's the what's the process like for for kind of a a, a, a low budgety you know uh, uh, guy like you to kind of get your hands on some of the really 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 great actors uh, to, to work with? What, what's the process like in in those days uh, over you know who, who's approachable and and and, and how and how, how, much, how how willing they are to do stuff and so forth. Could you give me, fill me in on your experience in that, in that kind of area? Sure. Uh, basically, the way it worked was I had a casting director who really was semi-retired. He had, he had been casting films at Paramount for many years, and uh, he left Paramount, uh, oh, maybe 10 years before I started working with him. Eddie Morris, M-O-R-S-E was his name. And uh, so, so and he had been uh, uh, casting films at Paramount probably for 25 years before he, he retired. But when he retired, he would do independent films once in a while. And I got to know Eddie, and uh, what I would do is I would get the script to Eddie, and I said, well, I have to go back to the first time I used Palance, because the second time I, I had already worked with him. So I contacted his agent directly and said, I have another picture for Jack. And the agent said, well, Jack liked working with you. Give me the script. I'll get it to him, and we'll see what we can do. But let me back up to the first time on Angel's Brigade when I worked with Jack Palance. So I got the script to Eddie, and uh, there was a role in there of, of the main bad guy. And uh, Eddie looked at it and, and uh, put some calls out to agents. And uh, the agents then would get back to Eddie and offer their clients, subject to the amount of money we could pay them and subject to the fact that the client would have to read the script to decide if they wanted to do it. Well, uh, uh, Jack Palance's agent uh, uh, got back to Eddie and said uh, Jack was available at the time that I told him I needed him for and that uh, he might be interested. So uh, Eddie called me and said, what do you think about Jack Palance? I said, oh, wow, that'd be terrific. It'd be great to see if you can get him. So we got him the script. At the time, uh, Jack was living in Pennsylvania. Uh, he had a farm there, and uh, he was making movies all over the world for many, many, many years. Uh, so we got him the script, and... Uh, uh, we made an offer. I think Jack worked on that film. I think he worked uh, six days. Five, five days is considered a week for Screen Actors Guild. I think he worked a week and one day. So um, anyhow, we got him the script, got him the shooting schedule, and uh, he agreed to do it. Now, I had not talked to Jack. I had not met him. It was all done through the agent. So Jack uh, was scheduled to work, say, on a Tuesday, and he flew from his Pennsylvania home to uh, the Universal Sheraton, the hotel there at Universal City. And uh, his agent called me and said, Jack would like to meet with you. I said, great, great. I'd like to meet him too. So I went uh, to his hotel room. And I remember it was the World Series. It was the St. Louis Cardinals versus the New York Yankees. This would have been in 78. Uh, so it would have been the fall, September, October of 1978. 
And I went to his room, knocked on the door. He let me in. We introduced ourselves, what have you. And the baseball game was going on. So we sat and watched the game for a few minutes. And we kind of chatted and talked. And he asked about the character and about uh, uh, how I was going to do this or do that. And uh, he said he had uh, some problems with the script, but he liked it overall and wanted to know if I would, um, uh, how I was going to handle certain things. <coughs> Excuse me. So after about, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes, uh, it was time for me to leave. And as I started out to walk out the door, I turned to him and I said, it's been nice working with you. And I meant to say, it's been nice meeting you. But I said, it's been nice working with you. And he growled back to me, I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> Um, I, I wanted to get you back to the little uh, uh, lively disc things. I, I was wondering, uh, did, uh, is there anything in your uh, imagination? How, how long do you think it takes for the, one of those things to kill you, or does the thing actually kill you, or does the Indi or does the alien kill you later after the thing? No, I think the things kill you, uh, and and it depends. Uh, obviously, how, how healthy you are, how big you are, how strong you are, etc. Now, I'm when they hit you. Palance, uh, once on the leg, he quickly gets out his knife and he's able to, to, to pull the thing off of, off of him. So it hasn't been able to dig in far enough and put, I think they have venom, put some venom into Palance. And then at one time in the truck, he shows the kids his scar on his arm where he had to, had to again cut one out. So uh, I think it, but, but when they hit Marty Landau, Landau is in shock. He doesn't do anything. And you can see them chewing on his chest. And in a matter of moments, Landau is down on the ground, presumably dead. Yeah, and, 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 and in fact, most of the people uh, tend, tend to panic a little bit. And I, I really liked uh, seeing this happen because when you, when you read, like, uh, people's abduction stories and so forth, and you know, I don't know whether to believe this or that, but um, it, when you read those abduction stories, they always describe, like, one of those, uh, I can't move, it, it might have hypnotic powers, and you always, you're always, you, uh, one of the curiosities that comes to me is, you know, can they really not move, or are they under powers, or are they just, is it just their own nerves shaking them? And your movie really shows that better than any other movie I've ever seen, because we, we get to see people in, in their in their uh, in their their mental frailties, you know, and you see one person who can react uh, more instantly and, and 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 save himself from it, and then you see other people that are that are done for. It's just an amazing thing, and just just wanted to compliment you again on that. All right, thank um, you. I, I wanted to get some more. Oh, you were in a, a very interesting movie um, that I I, uh, I, I I tracked it down eventually. It was Dracula versus Frankenstein. And um, uh, I, I, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about that film and uh, what, what you did on it. Could, could you point out your character to me in that film? Yeah, my character was named like you, Strange. Ah, oh. That was the character's name. Yeah, the, you know, I'm, I'm in the process now of writing my autobiography, and I've just been writing in the last few days about Dracula versus Frankenstein. Um uh, th that's a very complex story, but I'll, I'll try and cut it as short as I can. Um, uh, Al Adamson was a director that I met when I first uh, got out to Hollywood from the Midwest. And um, I had written a script called Satan Sadist, which was a motorcycle movie, and I, I had a part in that. And Al made that picture. It was a very, very successful picture. And then Al came to me and said he wanted to make a horror film, and I said he wanted me to write it. So uh, I wrote a picture called Blood Seekers. Blood Seekers was about a crazy scientist who was working, uh, was uh, was was uh, in uh, in the Venice Beach area, and he would send out uh, uh, his henchman, played by Lon Chaney. Uh, to, to grab girls on the beach and bring them into his laboratory, and he would do blood experiments on them. And the crazy scientist was played by J. Carol Nash. So we made that picture. Uh, Al Adamson directed, I had written it, and I had a co-starring part in it. Uh, again, the character's name was Strange. And I played kind of a, a, a hippie character. This would have been in 19... 
Hey, let me think for a second here. Nineteen sixty-nine, the spring of nineteen sixty-nine. It, it's it's real interesting the hippie characters in that film because you even have like cops who are like dressed up like funksters. Was that was that how it was kind of like back in those days? Well, uh, uh, not not really. What happened is Al made the picture, and uh, then a, a year maybe, or maybe even two years went by. And he, uh, uh, had, there, there was a distributor he was working with that wanted the picture to be called Dracula versus Frankenstein. So by that time, I was making my own pictures, and I was no longer working with Al. So Al uh, reshot uh, Bloodseekers and added the Dracula character, the Frankenstein character. Uh, was the Lon Chaney character from the original picture. <laughs> and uh, so I had nothing to do with Dracula versus Frankenstein. But I did have a lot to do with the Bloodseekers. So when you look at the picture, all the stuff that I am in and that uh, Anthony Isley is in and Lon Chaney is in and J. Carol Nash is in, is stuff that I wrote and I, I obviously acted in. But all the stuff with the Dracula character was added at a later time, and I was not, I was not even aware it was being done. They actually added a Frankenstein. Uh, that, that, uh, Lon Chaney wasn't the Frankenstein. They had like a, a, a big seven-foot-tall fellow called uh, John Bloom. John Bloom, uh, yeah. I, I, I think that, uh, well, I don't know. You, you, you know more about that picture than I do, but I thought that was supposed to be Cheney in some way or something. I, I don't know. Was it was Cheney in Dracula versus Frankenstein? Yeah, Ch Cheney had in fact the best part, and um, it's it, it's his, it's his last film, so I'm I'm glad he went out really well. And yeah, it's it's, it's just an amazing. It, it's 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 just like you described, like like you know, blood seekers, uh, someone going out and and recovering yeah. bodies for people. He's he's kind of like the Igor. Yeah, kind of exactly. Thing. Yeah, and that that that's a I, I really love that character. I'm I'm so glad that I, I found out that you wrote that that character because that's the best part of the movie. The the, the Dracula and and Frankenstein in that film are, are kind of weird. I'm, I'm kind of interested in the Dracula because it's got an interesting voice and stuff. But they put like Plato or something on on the on the film. yeah yeah kind of one. It's it's real hard to watch. Yeah. Um. Uh, okay. Were you done on that point, or did you want to say anything else on that? No, unless you have a question about that specific picture. As I say, I, I really don't know, because people ask me a lot about Dracula versus Frankenstein, and I have to go in this and say, look, I know something about maybe half the movie, but the other half I don't know anything about. So. All right. All right. Um, I was, I was going to ask you more about Without Warning. One thing, with, Without Warning is, is, is really hard to find, and there's a lot of rights issues. It was sold. It was with Filmways, then it went to Orion. Orion went bankrupt. It's technically owned by MGM right now, but they're neglecting it. It hasn't been released uh, since about uh, since the first time it was on VHS. Uh, any comments on its, on its availability and, 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 and rights status and so on? Well, uh, when I finished the picture, I made the uh, U.S. deal with AIP, American International Pictures. And <laughs> a week of signing the contract, AIP was purchased by Filmways. And then uh, Filmways eventually was purchased, like you say, by Orion. And then Orion <laughs> eventually was taken over by MGM. And I have been in negotiations with MGM, oh my goodness, uh, if I told you, at least a half a dozen years, where I owned the remake rights to the picture. And I've been trying to get them to release the picture on DVD, and they keep telling me they will. But I don't know if you know the situation at MGM, but they're always going in and out of bankruptcy or selling their country or company. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I'll be dealing with an executive for six months. I'll call and suddenly he's no longer even there. So they hold the U.S. Uh, uh, DVD home video rights. And uh, I own the remake rights, and I've wanted to remake the picture for some time. And... 
and uh, they keep saying yes, 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 but nothing happens. So it's very frustrating. I don't know why they don't do something with it because a lot of people are interested. Yeah, I, 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 I pulled it off the, the, the YouTube to show to my mother since it was so frustrating to try to find it. I was I yeah. I sort of made my little own copy. I don't usually do that, but in that circumstance, yeah. it's sort of necessary. All right, um, let's see. Uh, I'm almost done with you because it's almost the half hour point. Uh, let me, oh, uh, working with Kevin Peter Hall, I needed to ask you about. Yeah, well, uh, we needed, I wanted a, a seven foot guy. Uh, and uh, uh, Greg Canham actually found Kevin. Uh, Greg Canham was the guy that did the special effects makeup. Uh, he actually found uh, Kevin and uh, brought him in, introduced him to me, and uh, I thought he was perfect. He was intelligent. He was uh, very well coordinated and a uh, very polite, nice guy. And, you know, he had to sit in Greg Canham's makeup chair for hours to get that stuff put on. So uh, later, of course, uh, 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 he was the uh, similar alien in Predator. Yeah, yeah. Are you there? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. What? Wait a minute, I'm losing you. Go ahead. Oh, oh, you were all done with your point there, huh? Yeah. Okay, I thought, I thought you were continuing on. Yeah, and uh, let's see here. Um, with, oh well, I had a question about the monster's makeup because uh, it, it looks um, it looks really really good at, at the very end scene, but then there's uh, a, an earlier scene where the where the alien first shows up and it's it's kind of not lit as well. Is, is it the same makeup on both instances or? or yeah, just... sure. No, no. It, it it would be the same makeup. I felt, and I kind of got this from reading what Steven Spielberg. Not that I'm in any way comparing myself to him. Uh, what Steven Spielberg said about the monster in Jaws, and he said he didn't want to show it really full on until the very end because he w he wanted the audience to be more to let them fill in what they thought the alien was. So uh, I would have quick flashes of him, shadows of him, show his hand on things, and make a quick shot with the with the light swinging back and forth so that for a moment you see him, for a moment you don't. So until that end shot, when I dolly in on him there in the in the woods, and there's smoke all around and and fog and stuff of that nature, I thought that was an effective way to do it. Yeah, it, 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 and it was just to just to just to see a, a little bit and then a little more and more, and I just absolutely loved it when he when he's sneering his little upper lip at, at Pal and kind of holding him in the barn. Yeah, kind of like how my little Chihuahua does when you pick a flea up. <laughs> Anyway, okay, it's 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 the it's it's the thirty minute mark. I uh, I won't keep you forever. And I I just wanted to say it was it was a blast watching your movie. I'm I'm so glad you sat down uh, for this interview. Do uh, you got any uh, last words in parting? Well, I have I have a couple questions for you. Uh, is this what do you do with this now? Uh, this I, interview. I, I, I just put it on YouTube. For, uh, oh, okay. Well, when you put it on YouTube, uh, send me an email so I can find it. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you can put something in to telling people that I am in the middle of uh, writing my autobiography, and uh, you can also, if you could, somehow plug my website, which is GradenClark.com. Yeah, I, I will do that. And if you, and if you, and uh, since Palin is no longer with us, if you ever need a scrabbly voice fella like me, just yeah, right, right. Be sure though you send me an email so I can find it on YouTube.